My name's James, and I happen to be one of the pastors here at Southeastern University. And I'm so excited that you came home to conference this year. I believe that what God is gonna do over these next couple of days is gonna be transformational in our lives. I'd like to take a poll real quick in the room. How many of you drove or flew more than three hours to get to conference this year? Anybody over four hours? Five hours? Six hours? Seven hours? 10 hours? My goodness, where do you guys come from? Ohio? Wisconsin, my goodness. All right. Um, well, I also have a friend of mine in the room. Many of you have heard of him. Um, he's well known all over the country, but he happens to be my big brother. I'm so thankful to have Pastor Jimmy Rollins in the room tonight. Thankful that you're here. Love you. I want to honor our president. I believe scripture is very clear. Give honor where honor is due. And I'm thankful for our president. Oh, I'm thankful for a man who loves Jesus, who prays, prepares, and plans for you, strategizes and innovates so that what is happening in Lakeland doesn't stay in Lakeland, but literally it is around the globe. So many of you are from different extension sites. You're part of this family and it would not exist without our incredible president. Can we honor him tonight? So thankful for you, Dr. Engel, your vision, your leadership, and our incredible vice president, Bethany Thomas. I'm telling you, there's nobody like her on the planet. Nobody prays harder for you, I guarantee you, than Bethany Thomas. She does, and we are so thankful for her. Tonight, I believe what my assignment is, is to really help us correlate what heaven has always been and what it's always longed to be. But I learned a lesson about heaven, honestly, from the greatest person that I could honor tonight. She's not just our campus pastor. She's the love of my life for over 12 years, the one and only Brittany Powell. I love you. Man, I just want to make out with you right now. It's just like, I'm going to go over here. Praise God. I wasn't, I wasn't gonna say it. We have two amazing kids, Braxton who's nine and Grayson who's six. They're part of this thing too. And he's giving me the, the peace right now. But my wife taught me a very interesting thing about heaven. She taught me something about heaven that I even know she was teaching me about heaven. But like 14 years ago when I was chasing her down, I mean, I was doing everything I could. I, I, I tried to get her number. I tried to buy her gifts, flowers. I, I showed up places that she didn't expect me to be, which if I had not married her would have been very creepy and stalkerish, but I got her, right? And I remember one day I was, I was leaving Lafayette, Louisiana, where she's from, and I was getting ready to go. And, and I'll be real, I was a little bit emotional because I loved her and I, I was ready to like make this thing last forever, but we were still dating and so I'm getting ready to get on the plane and don't judge me, bro, but I, I cried a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean I needed lots of tissues and there was snot and there was a, that little bulldog thing when you cry too hard, you know what I mean? I remember my friend Mike Miller, he, he's a pastor up in Halifax, Canada. I remember when he told me, he said, James, you wanna know why you're already so sad? He said, because you're homesick. I was like, homesick? Like, no, I miss, I miss Brit. He said, yeah, home has become a face, not a place. He's like, no, no, no. See, James, you got to understand that now your home, the place you find comfort and security, the place that you find love and compassion, that's wrapped up in a person. Oh, what I learned in dating her was a lot more about my relationship with Jesus. Was that heaven is not just a place that we long to go to, but it's a person who loves us and cares for us. His name's Jesus. Scripture makes us this promise though. Uh, the disciples, they gather around Jesus, his closest friends, and they say, hey, Jesus, of all the things we've seen you do, we've seen you do miracles, you've raised the dead, you've done all of this, but would you teach us to pray? And I think it's interesting that those closest to him who saw him do all the things that we find ourselves as followers of Jesus chasing, they said, would you just teach us to talk to the Father? And Jesus said this in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. He said, this then is how you should pray, our Father 
in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And many of us, if we're honest, there are moments in our life where we are grieving the future. We're missing. We're going, man, I cannot wait to get there. We're, we're homesick for a place that we've experienced here and now, but one day we'll fully live then and there. It's homesick. I'm homesick for heaven. What does heaven look like? It's a place where there's no more pain, where there's no more sorrow, there's no more weeping, there's no more hopelessness. No, it's a place where all things are made right again. But there's something interesting about being homesick for heaven, especially in our culture today. I remember when I was about 12 or 13 years old, my parents had decided to send me on this mission trip. And by mission trip, I mean they sent me to this like boot camp intense. If we're being real, real about it, being so for real about it, it was a little cult like uh, it, it was like three months long. They uh, had the worst food I've ever experienced. We had to run obstacle courses. Um, I don't know if you can tell, I don't run anywhere ever. They're like, no, you're going to run obstacle courses and you're going to climb these walls. I said, God made me a short king. I'm 5'8 on a good day. I'm not supposed to climb anything. But about three weeks into this missions trip cult camp that they sent me to, I remember I was so homesick. Oh, I mean, I'm a teenager, but man, I just, I, I'll be real with y'all, I miss my Mama, I miss my mama. I'm a mama's boy. I was missing my mama. I remember like we're staying in these tents and it's hot and uh, it's sweaty and it, it, it's just sad. You know, I'm longing for home, my mom and air conditioning all at once. I remember one night, man, the, the homesickness got the best of me and I started crying. Started off just a little hot tear. You know what I mean? But when you let one out, and there's a lot of it inside. You know what happens, right? It just, it just all comes out. And, and we're sharing a tent with other people. And, and they're like, man, we're trying to sleep. I'm like, I'm trying to sleep too. <laughs> you know? They're like, what's wrong? I'm like, I just feel good. <laughs> you know? And I found myself, no lie, I found myself outside the tent. Don't judge me. I found myself outside the tent. And I'm going, mama, <laughs> mama. She couldn't hear me. She's like a thousand miles away. Mama, I miss you. I miss you so much. And one of the leaders, oh, thank you for having compassion. I got over it. Uh, I remember, though, being so sad and so upset, the leader came over and found me. They, they said, James, what's wrong? I said, I just missed my mom. I said, can I call her? They said, no, James, you can't call your mom because if you hear your mom's voice, it'll make you more homesick. And I think I'm convinced, and I would submit to you tonight, that the reason that culture is raising its intensity around immorality while there's a continued advancement and an attack on the local church is because culture realizes if they hear the voice of their father, the homesickness for heaven gets worse. Oh, see, I'm not, I'm not frustrated with culture. I'm not going to get mad at people who don't follow Jesus for not acting like people who follow Jesus. Instead, I have compassion to go, you're homesick and you don't even know it. So when Jesus tells the disciples, this is how you pray, it was in order not just so God could hear their voice, but so that they could hear his. What would it look like for you and I to be conduits wherever we go that people sense, hear, feel heaven? Oh, that it makes them more homesick. They go, no, I, I can't continue to do what I've always done because I need what you have. What if we're not waiting to eternity to live like heaven with hope, with healing, with justice, with compassion, and with restoration? I'll oh, see the New Testament is very clear. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, the apostle, he wrote this letter to the early church. He said this, don't you know that you yourselves are in God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Another translation of this verse would use the word tabernacle, and tabernacle would be a, a place where the Spirit of God would dwell in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you had to go to a special place, you had to be a special person, and somehow in that, you would be able to attain this relationship or this understanding that God is pleased with you. 
But Paul upsets the apple cart in the New Testament. And he says, no longer is it special places. No, no, no. No longer will God be contained in buildings like this. No longer will he be contained in a holy place. He has come to redeem, restore, renew, and fill a holy people. Heaven wasn't meant to be contained in a building. The church isn't an address or a location. It's a group of people who have said, I'm committed to the voice of my Father. And if I can hear his voice, I can be a container for heaven. Oh, man, what would it look like for you and I to get an understanding, recognize tonight that heaven isn't far away. Not if heaven dwells in us. Oh, what would it look like for us to walk out of here tonight? To walk into a world full of pain, full of stress, full of death and decay, and carry the hope of heaven. Well, if we're containers of heaven, then let's be real with it. Why then does it feel like we're living in hell? Let's just be real about it. Like, like I said it, and you're like, yeah, yeah, we're containers of heaven. But at the same time, you know on the inside, you go, but everything else that you describe, death, pain, sickness, all of that matches up with my current reality. I think Jesus paints this beautiful picture as he walks and talks with people in the New Testament. I want to go to the Gospel of Mark, and I want to look at how Jesus handles a house that death is in, but he came as the outposts of heaven so that one day we might be containers of that heaven. Now, Mark is important in the New Testament as a gospel because we recognize that John Mark wrote this gospel with a certain tone and tenor. Can I just give us a little bit of theological background just for a moment? I want to give us just a little bit of context so we understand the call that God has for us tonight. John Mark does something interesting. In all of his writing, he comes to declare that Jesus was establishing himself as king and a new kingdom. He did so in such a way that literal kings on this planet wanted to murder Jesus when he was just a baby because they thought he's going to seize my power. They did not understand that we were not getting a ruling royal king. We were getting a redeeming king. That he wasn't coming as a strong king. He was coming as a servant king. That he wasn't just coming as a king who would win. He was coming as a king who would bear our wounds. So when Jesus walking and talking with people, establishing this new kingdom so that he could one day have outposts across this earth for heaven to come down and be experienced here and now. He experienced pain, loss, tragedy, and death. In the Gospel of Mark in chapter 5, there are two passages that if you've been around church for any season, you've likely heard one of the two stories that's most represented in Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we see not only is there a religious leader that he is experiencing pain and loss, but then there's a woman who's had an issue of bleeding for over a decade. I want us to look at the life of a man named Jairus. Now, in order to look at this life of a man named Jairus, i got to be real about my roots. I am originally from Alabama. And so, that's bold to cheer for that right now. I'm going to apologize, and I'm going to go over here and talk about Alabama. Um, so being from Alabama, i got to be real, uh, the later it gets in the evening, about right now, 8.30 is my bedtime. I'm, I'm old at this point in life. And the later it gets, the more my country accent comes out. And when I was growing up, this passage, this man named Jairus, I would hear preachers always, they would preach about Jairus. <laughs> Say, I'm telling y'all, Jairus came to Jesus. So probably the first five years of me preaching, I preached about J. Iris. So if tonight my Alabama roots come climbing out and I preach about Jairus and J. Iris, you just got to rock with me. Y'all with me tonight? All right. So Mark chapter 5, I want to go into the story in verse 22. It says, it's then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus. Oh, now let me help y'all real quick. When we preach in this culture, when I pause, you talk. All right, I got to help y'all real quick. We'll try it again. We'll just exercise real quick. Uh, then one of the synagogue leaders named? Oh, y'all ready to have church. Okay, he came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Number one, this is important. We need to recognize the posture of this prominent individual named Jairus. Jairus had power and status accompanied with prestige and provision, and yet he has a need that is so deep that he comes and falls at Jesus' feet. As a synagogue leader, he would have been an opponent of Jesus' ministry. But when your loss is great enough, you realize that solutions are just on the other side of a touch from Jesus. So he comes, he, he sees Jesus, he falls at his feet. He pleads with him earnestly, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be made heal and live. So Jesus went 
with him. I don't want us to miss the first part of this passage, that Jesus has compassion on what we're dealing with. We have to recognize he's a compassionate king. I think if we're not careful, the tones of shame, guilt, and cancel culture have crept into the church in such a way that we are living lives of hiding instead of lives of healing. Jairus says, I'm going to expose this thing so that Jesus can do something about it. I've tried everything else. I've kept the law. I've given money. I've made sacrifices, but I need a Savior. From this text tonight, I want to talk on the topic of heaven's home. Heaven's home. God, I thank you for your word. It's the only thing that you promise will never return void, that it has oil on it. Tonight, we submit to your word. I pray that everything that's not of you would be canceled out and that, God, everything that is from your word would set out all that it's accomplishing to do. God, I pray there would be purpose and power for what you have to say to us tonight. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. So this doesn't look like heaven. When there's pain and loss and a little girl dying, that doesn't look like heaven. It doesn't feel like heaven. But Jesus doesn't allow death and destruction to merely keep happening. If we're experiencing a broken world out here, we must first allow God to do some renovations in here. What would it look like for you and I to establish for the next few moments that our heart, our heart being not just the organ that beats on the inside of us, but as the early Hebrews would have believed, our heart would be all of us, our mind, body, soul, and spirit. What if that has all been created to house heaven? What if heaven's home has always longed to be right here? If that's the case, then how Jesus treats the house of Jairus, it may be how Jesus wants to treat us. We're going to skip a portion of scripture, but because I know some of you would love to email me about me skipping that and possibly accuse me of not having it in the correct context, let me for time's sake and brevity explain what I'm passing over. There is a woman with an issue of blood and why Jesus is going to heal one problem, another problem saw, it shows up. And so he takes care of this problem. And in doing so, uh, he goes back to Jairus. He goes, okay, she's healed and whole. Now let's figure out what we're doing. But while he's getting ready to go back to Jairus in Mark chapter five and verse 35, it says this, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said this, your daughter is now, let's just talk about the social awkwardness. Like, you don't even say, good afternoon. You don't say, hey, hey, Jairus, what's up, my guy? How you doing? Everything okay? Like, this is the most socially inept person that we see in Scripture. Maybe some of us could just take that as a moment and just say, God, would you help the spirituality uh, make some newness of my social skills? Amen. So they said, this is interesting. They said, why bother the, the teacher? This is important. We're going to pause. Please leave it on the screen. When it says the teacher, they don't see the power of Savior. See, they're still standing in his presence. They just say, hey, your daughter's dead. But Jairus knew that he was a way maker. He was a miracle worker. That is who he is. So he says, why bother the teacher overhearing what they said? Jesus told them, don't be afraid, just just trust, just believe, just believe that I am who you believed I was on the front end. Tonight for us to navigate why we long for heaven, but yet it feels like hell, we must recognize that Jesus is contending with us and for us. Oh, that his Holy Spirit did not come to condemn us, John 3, 17. Jesus did not come into this world so that he would condemn us, but so that through him we might be saved. Saved there meaning whole. Every part of our lives made right and coming in alignment with heaven's goal. So if we are to abide in God and God to abide in us, then let's look at how Jesus handles the house of a dying girl. In Mark chapter five and verse 38, it says this, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. The context of this is these are likely paid or hired mourners. These are people that were weeping and, and going on. There's another verse that says they played a dirge, just sad music, right? I think it's like country music. They're just out there saying, man, he, he lost his daughter. He lost his dog. He, you know, he, they came and repoed his truck. You know, it's just, they're sad. They're doing their thing. Jesus comes in. He's like, all these people are crying. He went and said to them, why all this commotion? Why y'all carrying on? Like, why are y'all acting out right now? Why are, you, why are you doing all this? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they 
laughed at him. Just real quick, it's never good to laugh at Jesus <laughs> because what he's willing to do, uh, after that, he put them all out. Oh, I love the savagery of our Savior. <laughs> he said, y'all don't laugh at me, get out. <laughs> now, this is important for us to recognize because Jesus comes to this place as a container of heaven, but the house was not in order. Many of us, we long for heaven. We get excited about heaven coming inside of us. But if the house is out of order, heaven can't come down. So Jairus, Jairus is standing by. Jesus comes in, looks at all of these people crying, looks at all of these people wailing. And he says, no, 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 you got to get out. In order for me to do what I'm going to need to do in this house, you got to get out. I think there's a couple of things that we've got to get out of the house of our heart. I think it's important for you, to, you and I to recognize that there's some things that have made their way in. And if we're not careful, we just invite Jesus into the house of our heart along with all the other things that we have packed away. Oh, we've been carrying around baggage. It, it's nicely packaged so that no one really knows. But if you get a glimpse on the other side of the wall of our hearts, there's some stuff on the inside. First thing that we recognize from these people is they doubted. They doubted. Now, listen, I'm not here to demonize doubt. Doubt is often the beginning of faith. But when confronted with the power and reality of who Jesus was, they still said, ha, 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 there's no way she's dead. There are some people that if you're not careful, it does not matter how much purpose you see around you, they always see what's wrong. Oh, Jairus could have easily doubted, but he doesn't join in with them. I think it's important for us to recognize what Jesus said on the front end. He gave him a preemptive response. He said, don't be afraid, just believe. For some of us, it's coming into this moment going, no, I'm not gonna keep doubting everything that God said just because things don't look like it yet. See, we gotta ask ourselves, am I just gonna say everything I see or I'm gonna see what God said? See, faith is saying, in spite of my circumstances, in spite of this little girl appearing to be dead, Jesus said, she's just sleeping. She's taking a nap. And when Jesus is in the room, things change. Maybe it's not doubt. Maybe it's porn. You're like, no, 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 Pastor James, go back to doubt. Go back to doubt. Can we be real? According to statistics in this room, this is one of the greatest struggles of our generation. Porn talking to a friend recently, we talked about how accessibility to your eyes and to your hearts has been the enemy's greatest tool in your generation. It's making this accessible at all times, at all places. Used to, you had to go to a gas station, you had to bribe somebody, you had to buy the magazine, you had to hide it away, but it exists at your fingertips 24 seven. But I love what Job said. He said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I will not sin against the Lord God. Oh, you gotta, you gotta kick some things out of your life. If, you're, if you really want heaven to come down and we really wanna lead people to heaven, we have to stop living like hell. Listen, porn, porn isn't just what exists at your fingertips though. The desire for it starts right here. In the battlefield of our minds, what would it look like for us to go, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell the enemy, you no longer got a place in here. No, if I really want heaven, healing, hope, restoration, I'm gonna allow Jesus to kick porn out of my life tonight. Oh, see, because if I keep inviting Jesus in a crowded house full of chaos, I'm not giving him his full authority to redirect and lead my life. So maybe it's, maybe it's not porn, maybe it's fear. Maybe tonight, one of your greatest fears, one of your greatest fears is, what if I go all in on this thing? What if, what if I trust God? What if I trust his good plans and he sends me somewhere I don't wanna go or he calls me to do something I don't wanna do? Oh, see, fear wants to lie to us about a God that loves us. And as long as the enemy can pack our hearts and our house full of fear, faith will never be able to invade it. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. This morning we heard a powerful message from one of my big bros, Pastor Sean Johnson, on the topic of anxiety. He was one of the first people who helped me address anxiety in my own life. I've been learning from him for a decade far away, but I watched him be vulnerable about it. 
I, I watched him as he contended and he decided I'm not gonna just live with anxiety attacks. I'm gonna attack anxiety. See, you have to recognize you got weapons for every place the enemy tries to put a foothold in your life. There's a weapon called his word. So I can cast all my cares on him for he cares for me. I will not stay up late at night spiraling, wondering about tomorrow or tonight or the next day because I know the one who cares for me. I don't have to care about it when he's got me. If it ain't anxiety, we know who was in the house. You're like, come on, Pastor James, be real. It was people in there, people who were paid to mourn, paid to weep, paid to profit off my pain. Listen, before I unpack this next box, I need you to know something. There's some people in your life who they never want you to be healed or whole because they like you sick and crippled because you depend on them. When Jesus comes in with restoration, with healing, with renewal, he does so, so that he's the only one that we'll depend on. Oh, if it had not been for Jesus. So maybe it's negative people. Negative people in your life. Oh, I don't care if it's haters, demotivators, distractators. I don't know who's in your life that's being negative, but constantly profiting off your pain. They always want to remind you where you used to be. That's why they don't want to give up on a little girl being dead. That's why they want to laugh at Jesus, because they would rather her die and them get everything they wanted from Jairus. But when Jesus comes in and begins to kick some things out, healing and restoration on the other side. So I wonder if some of y'all tonight don't want to serve an eviction notice on the enemy. Say, I'm going to stop tolerating doubt. I don't have to live with this. Just because culture says I got a doubt and deconstruct, I'm not going to live that way. Just because culture says that porn's okay, just because they make it accessible, doesn't mean I'll live that way. I came to serve an eviction notice tonight to say I'm done being tolerant. I'm done putting up with it. I wish you would tonight. emotionless devotion, but I wish you wouldn't wait to the end of service to serve an eviction notice on the enemy. There is a lie that the enemy has told you that you got to tolerate this mess. I wish you would get sick of being sick tonight and say, no, if the healer's in the room, I'm kicking this out. So I dare you to lift your hands and make a declaration. The enemy's got to go. I'm not living with sickness in my family. I'm not living with brokenness in my life. I'm serving an eviction notice. say right now we're serving the eviction notice yeah. we're not gonna let anybody else inhabit your place if you came to redeem me if you came to restore me if you came to fill me this has to go I'm done living with boxes of old I'm done living with boxes of past and pain tonight we kick it out I pray for every person on the sound of my voice on site online God that right now they would make a decision to stop tolerating the enemy in their life they would be fed up enough to kick fear out and say that the devil is alive once you sit down that's just point number one the first thing you gotta do is serving the eviction notice to the enemy but I'm gonna be real with you the reason this point's got to be quick is I ain't wasting no more time dealing with the devil. I, I'm done having conversations with the enemy. The next time the enemy tries to pop up in your life and remind you of your past or remind you of your failures or your pain, you need to just go, no, 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 I don't have time for that. And you use the weapon of God's word, you use the weapon of worship to declare that the enemy has to evict your life. So we got it cleaned out, but we don't have it filled up. I remember growing up, my mom, she had a, a couple of rules. Whenever you want to invite a friend over, right? We want to invite a friend over. You knew, first of all, don't you ever ask in, 
in front of your mama. Oh, man. If I made that mistake, me and the judge, that was a paddle or a belt, we were going to talk at home, right? Like there was no way. You didn't ever ask in front of him. But the second thing you had to do is if you ask your mom, you say, Mom, can Clay come over? The first thing that she's going to ask me is your Oh, y'all got the same mama, though. All right, I told y'all we were family. Is your room clean? Cleaning out is just the first step. See, because if we just kick out the other people, but we don't invite Jesus in, nothing changes. And if we really want to be theological about it, if we just kick these things out, Scripture says this, that if you kick out an unclean spirit, but the house is not full, it'll go out in the dry places and get five more come on back again. But we're not just living empty. We clean in house so he can fill our house. Oh, I'm going to serve an eviction notice on the enemy. But the second thing that I'm going to do is this. I'm going to choose to send an invitation to my Savior. Oh, one of the first things that Jairus did is he went to Jesus, fell at his feet. But I love what Jesus does in Mark chapter 5 and verse 39. It says this. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him. And he went in. He went in. Oh, there's so much hope in this. Can you, can you lean in on this for a second? I'm thankful that he still goes into broken circumstances. I'm so thankful he goes into places that I ain't figured out yet. I'm thankful that he still takes me by the hand and goes in and goes, wait, 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 come on. Hey, that's all gone, but I still got a plan takes the father and mother and he goes in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Can I make it personal for you for a second? When Jesus comes in, he speaks to the dead things. Some dead dreams in the room tonight. Some dead callings in the room tonight. Some dead identities. When Corey's singing sons and daughters, some of us shudder at the thought. Going, no, 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 I'll just be a servant. No, he calls you son and daughter. He comes in to that place and says, get up. Wake up. Wake up, sleeper. Wake up, dead dream. Wake up to the thing that you've forgotten about. The response is incredible. If that's where the story ended, it's, it's still not resolved, but it says this, immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. I can't help but think about the old song, can't nobody do me like Jesus. You don't know why? Because I get to respond to what David only hoped for in the Old Testament. In Psalm, I believe, 51, David made this, this prayer, this poetic prayer to God. He said, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. Did you know that the Hebrew word there for create is bara? You're like, okay, what about that? I like it because it's like bara. <laughs> create in me a clean heart. Create bara. But what you may not know. Is it in Genesis 1? The same Hebrew word for creating me a clean heart. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. It was darkness, void, and without form. That means that when I invite Jesus into the house, he barah on my life. He, he creates out of chaos, out of formless, out of void. He comes in and says, no, I'll create a clean heart in you. Oh, I, you kick the enemy out, but I'm going to redeem some things. Oh, there's some ways that the enemy twisted your thought life. He, he twisted your fears and your doubts and your anxiety. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to barah. I'm going to create. Oh, God is the great creator. We serve both father and creator, one who cares for us, but creates in us all things new. See, when some of us evicted the enemy, we felt shame. We felt sadness. When you saw the thing that you deal with, or maybe the Holy Spirit dropped that thing in your heart, all you thought about was, I'm so messed up, I'm so broken. No, 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 you serve 
a creative God who says, I'll come in and I'll create all things and make all things new. When Jesus gets in the house, we're reminded that our greatest solution cannot be our last option. Oh, we can't run everywhere else. Try everything else. Many of us, if we're not careful, we've done more personality tests than we memorize passages. We think we're learning about us on the Enneagram and yet we come to God's word and we don't line up, we don't know who we are. But if we could get a picture of how Father, Creator God sees us, that He's rewiring and redesigning. Some of you have just lived with a house that's messed up. You've gone, no, man, I, I don't know my identity anymore. I don't know my desires anymore. And God goes, it's okay. Let me, bruh, let me come in and create all things made new. There is no name like the name Jesus. You say, okay, PJ, how do I, how do, I do it? Like, give me the process. What's the steps? You know, give me the one, two, three. How, how do I get Jesus in the house? Okay, give me, like, we open the door. You know, see all the people, you know, like what happens? Jesus said, I am as near as the mention of my name. You may have missed it. When we sang Jesus, he was already working. Oh, there's no name like his name. It's the name that heals. It's the name that restores. It's the name that redeems. It's the name that creates and makes all things new. I wish somebody in the room would elevate the name above every name. He is Jesus. He is Messiah. Oh, he's the one who never gives up or quits. hands lifted would you just say right where you are Jesus always oh, as near as the mention of his name there is no prescription or procedure for his presence it's just simply Jesus God I pray that you begin to wake up dead things everything that we gave up on I pray that tonight we would surrender it to your miracle working power it's not dead it's just asleep it's not gone it's right here oh yeah 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 you're right on the edge of what he wants to do in your heart mm. it's point number two you got to sit down third and last point is this 
The third and last point is this, is you need to receive your qualification. See, Jesus comes into this house. He heals this little girl. He raises the dead or wakes up the one who was sleeping. And it's great for you and I to kick out the enemy of our life. Way to go. It's great for us to allow Jesus to fill our hearts. Way to go. But friends, if that's all we do, and we stay in a repeated cycle of righteousness and a sin cycle, all we're ever doing is falling away and coming close. But for us to be containers of the kingdom as he designed us to be, to carry heaven with us everywhere we go, we recognize that everything we've been exposed to, he wants to now illustrate through our lives. Oh, if he's resurrected some things in my life, now I have a responsibility to do something with it. This same passage is not only in Mark, it's also in Matthew and Luke, but something interesting takes place. See, I've always wondered, why did Jesus take in Peter, James, and John? It wasn't as if Jesus needed them to stir his faith. Jesus kicks those people out, takes the father and mother in, but then he takes in Peter, James, and John. And I've wrestled with this, and then when I went to the Gospel of Matthew, I found on the next chapter, in Matthew chapter 10, the miracle takes place in nine, and in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus does something incredible as he sends out the 12, those who are closest to him. He says this, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Hold on a second. He didn't say proclaim this message everywhere I go. Oh, see, he was the container of heaven until he went away. He said, I send you something greater and you will do greater things than this. Why? Because now heaven is in you. Everywhere you go, you are proclaiming heaven has come close. That means every time I walk into a broken situation, heaven came close. Every time I'm surrounded by doubting people, heaven came close. Every time I'm dealing with people who are addicted to porn, heaven came close. That means freedom, justice, compassion, mercy, and joy are in me. Oh, we got to stop praying for God to change the world and just say, use me to do it. He says, everywhere you go, proclaim that the heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, and freely you have received. Now freely give. He gives them this proclamation. The problem is, we're still wrestling with qualification. One of the people who deal with this, his name is Peter. He listens to Jesus. He's sent out and commissioned. Everywhere you go, heaven has come close. And yet Peter's so scared to even associate with Jesus that he cusses out a little girl. He goes to war with a soldier. <laughs> Does all of these things. But I'm thankful that God doesn't disqualify somebody because of their shortcomings. See, if you earned your calling, other people can cancel it. Oh, I've heard it said that God doesn't call the qualifier, he qualifies the call. But I'd like to take it a step further and say, it's your calling that qualified you in the first place. Oh, it's the calling to be a container of heaven that qualifies you to heal the sick and raise the dead. That's not reserved for people who stand on this stage or have some special superpower. No, heaven, the redemptive work, the place where all things are made new, the barah of God now dwells in you. So my qualification comes in the proclamation of my Savior. That means everywhere I go and everything I do, I go, Jesus, you sent me. I, I, I would like, honestly, to... I would like to just preach this message and preach and then amen and walk off stage. But I got to tell you that point three is one of the greatest wrestling matches of my life. First time that I remember feeling isolated, different, alone, unqualified, first grade. I was first half of first grade. I was going to a school called Susan Moore. No red lights, no stop signs, just a blinking red light. That's it. And going to school there, I remember when they started pulling me out of my class. I was in Miss Susan Adams' class. and They pulled me out and they started putting me in a different room. They put headphones on my ears and they were trying to examine something was wrong with my speech and my auditory abilities. 
They said I had a glitch. They said I had a deficit. They started telling me I was unqualified. Some trauma from our past that keeps creeping into our present. It keeps trying to unqualify us. In fourth grade, I remember sweet teacher. Probably meant the best in the world, but I'll never forget. I loved to talk back then. I was a clown. I remember one day I'd pulled all the cards I could pull. That's what you had to do back then. You had to pull cards, right? It usually went green, yellow, red for everyone else. <laughs> for me, it was green, yellow, blue, turquoise, purple, orange, chartreuse, right? <laughs> I remember I got to red. She was so frustrated. She looked at me and said, James Powell, you talk too much. You'll never amount to anything. It hurt a little then, but some wounds you don't know you really have till you get older. Some of our memories, if we go back in our past, we got to unpack some boxes. I told you about doubting God, but I didn't tell you what it's like to have to kick the enemy out when you just doubt yourself. Junior high, I began to experience emotional, verbal, physical, and sexual abuse. Felt like I was dirty, like I was worthless. I didn't have dreams. I remember laying in bed in a house, going, I can't wait till I get my parents to get me a go-kart. I'm gonna give me this go-kart, I'm just gonna run away. I was 14 years old, just knew I didn't belong. I just knew I didn't live up to what people wanted. I felt like I was unqualified to be seen by my first grade teacher. I was unqualified to be gifted enough for my fourth grade teacher. And maybe because of all this pain, I wasn't qualified to even be loved by those I call family. 17, I end up homeless, living in the back of my Ford Explorer, abusing prescription drugs and alcohol. Because you come to a place where you feel so unqualified, you just live into it. You just accept the label the enemy put on you. And so because I felt unqualified, I just decided to live unqualified. Remember, it took some people coming into my life in the midst of homelessness, in the midst of abusing prescription pills and alcohol, doing everything I could just to numb pain. They came in, they said, God doesn't have a plan B for your life. I remember I was so mad at them. I want to fight them. I'm like, shut up. Like, we love you. I was like, I hate you. I didn't want to believe again. Because believing meant I could get hurt again. They welcomed me into their house. They loved me. They gave me a place to stay. They registered me in school. So I did two years of community college. I spent the next several years pursuing the call of God in my life. Been preaching since I was about 17 years old. Got the opportunity to work at some amazing, amazing churches. But if I'm real with you, I sat in a lot of rooms where I still felt unqualified. I feel like if they really knew, they wouldn't love me. If they really knew, they wouldn't choose me. I remember when Southeastern University called. They were calling a lot of pastors and figuring out what they were gonna do, and they called us. And I remember I got off the phone and I laughed. I told Brett, I said, they must not know. See, we had worked at amazing churches, but I never finished school. I dropped out of community college. I had gone to nursing school, film school. I was going to be an accountant for one semester, but hated math, so that didn't work. <laughs> so they must not know. We got on a plane, flew across the country from Sacramento, California. And I remember, man, I, I went and bought polo shirts. I didn't even own polo shirts, but I was like, higher ed people, they're always dressing up. So maybe like a polo and some Lulu pants, like put on some like glasses and walked in like I, I don't feel smart so I'll try to look smart and I thought they didn't know I was like I guess, I guess they don't they don't know so what'll happen is they'll be really nice to us but I'm gonna protect my heart because at the end of this they're gonna reject me and I'm gonna go back to feeling like a first grade a fourth grade a junior high a 17 year old who's just unqualified I got into the second meeting of the day and Dr. Chris Owen says, hey, before we do anything else, I need you to know, I know about your educational background and that does not disqualify you for what God has for you. Yeah. 
You need some people in your corner to remind you how God sees you. It'd be safe for me to end there, but the call of God on my life forces me to a place of authenticity that often I don't wanna go. This past week was really hard. In the past week, I've lost my grandmother. In the past week, I faced anxiety, the most debilitating that I've faced in over a year. Sat in an office last Thursday. I said, just let me get somebody else to preach. I said, I'm too, I'm too messed up right now. I said, my anxiety is crippling me. I don't want to stand on a stage. I don't want to be in a room full of people. I just, like, I feel so messed up. The night before I contemplated going to a hospital, I was like, I just need sleep. Just let me go to sleep for two, two days and let me wake up. I'll go to conference. I'll smile. Hey, good to see you. God bless you. Amen. And I had somebody sit across from me. I said, no. I said, well, no, 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 no. I came to you. I told you where I'm going through. I said, no, there's a call of God on your life. And no matter circumstances, my calling supersedes the obstacles that the enemy places. So tonight, I don't feel it. Tonight, I'm still struggling, but I decided that crawling counts in the kingdom of God. And if he qualifies the call, then he'll still do it for me. He can do it for you. I don't know what's going on around you. I don't know what's going on inside of you. But we have this hope that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So tonight, I came to challenge you to take your place rightfully as the container of heaven, to realize the responsibility of what God's placed in you. I don't do this with flippant words or churchy cliches. I'm trying to live it with you and say, no, no, no. If God's done all this for us, what are we gonna do for others around us? Many of us, we struggle because we don't know the next step. You go, okay, PJ, what do I do? You take the next step, you're like, I don't know what it is. I love how Creator God helps us see His power in creation. We see both strength and struggle in creation. One of the interesting things that I researched this week is about impalas. I don't know if you know this about impalas, but not the impala, <laughs> the impala. <laughs> I don't know if you know this about an Impala, but it can jump over 10 feet high and it can cover over 30 feet in distance. It's majestic. It's beautiful. God wired it so that it can evade the enemy and the predators. But do you know that an Impala can be contained in a zoo by simply a three foot wall? Because the Impala won't jump if it doesn't see what's next. What if tonight we decided I'm gonna have faith to jump over the obstacle? <laughs> I'm gonna have faith to say he's wired me in such a way that I'm gonna say every obstacle is an opportunity. Every fear I'm gonna remove and replace with faith. I wish tonight I had some people. I ain't got a one, two, three for you. We're not closing eyes, but I wish a few people would meet me down here and say, I'll jump into justice. I'll jump into mercy. I'll jump into my calling because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world.
the next few moments, our prayer team's gonna be in to pray for you. We're gonna pray and release the oil on your life. See, the oil is what separates you and qualifies you. Without oil, David's still a shepherd. Without oil, Moses is still a murderer. Without oil, Samson's still addicted to sex. But oil separates everything, and the oil of your life is the calling that God has. See, I look back now at all the pain, and I go, oh, that was the crushing. That was the crushing of the enemy. Oh, it was always against my mouth and my words. But now what God has used on the other side of the crushing is the oil. The very thing the enemy attacked was the place that he wanted to anoint. Now I've had the ability to go into places that nobody else would and say, if God did it for me, he can do it for you. So I'm asking you all over this room, if tonight you're ready to say, I want to take my rightful place as a container of heaven, I'm gonna ask you to join us down here and we're gonna pray that tonight God's spirit would fill your life and his anointing would rest on you.